Hey guys, you're listening to Untamed Wildlife Photography. It's our first episode and I'm so excited. Um, my dog's excited too, he's going crazy in the background. Might have to cut this out later. Are you going wild, baby? Going crazy? Wow. Oh yeah, it sounds like it, yeah. Anyways, for our very first episode, we're going to be talking about visual narrative. Um, I wanted to start this podcast out strong, and visual narrative is one of the pillars of becoming a great wildlife photographer. I don't just say that, I know that. I look at the Instagrams of great photographers, and I, I look through their pictures before I did this episode, and I was like, wow, yeah, that's they're, they're doing visual narrative. So, some of you have... Some of you have a grasp on what visual narrative is, and some of you don't. That's perfectly fine. We all start out somewhere. So I'm gonna give you um I'm gonna give you a quick rundown on what visual narrative is in wildlife photography. So the visual narrative refers to the story being told within your photo. There's gonna be tension, drama, or some other emotion. There's gonna be a story within that photo. Like, you're going to be able to infer or plain out see a beginning, middle, and end. So, an example of a photo with visual narrative might be a alligator that is creeping up on a great blue heron. You know there's that that's the beginning of a story right there. You Something's about to happen. So it has that tension. It has that drama. You might feel emotions about like, oh no, is it going to get the heron? Uh, you know, it, stuff like that. What's going to happen next? Is the heron going to get away? Is the heron going to get eaten? We don't know. That's a visual narrative. That's a story right there. It makes you start thinking and wondering and it gives, it gives you emotions. So like I said, this is what I consider to be one of the pillars of what takes a average wildlife photographer up to a great wildlife photographer. That is putting focus on and capturing visual narrative. All right, so is visual narrative something you need to focus more on? Well, if you have a gallery full of beautiful wildlife shots, but all of your animals are sort of uh, stationary, they're not doing really anything, they, they may be posed beautifully, they might be standing beautifully, the background could be beautiful, the foreground could be beautiful, the animal's beautiful, the lighting's great. All of that stuff is great, but if they're not doing anything and if there's no story, then it is time to start putting some focus on visual narrative. So now that we talked a little bit about what visual narrative what <laughs> what visual narrative is and uh, the kind of people who need to look more into this and make this uh, a bigger priority when they go to shoot. We're going to talk about how you can do that. So how you can get more visual narrative in your shots. Man, I'm saying that word a lot. Sorry, guys. We're going to let's cut it down to just narrative. How you can get more narrative in your shots. First up. Tip number one is going to be connect with the eyes. This is kind of what I would consider low-level narrative. Low, yeah, we'll just say low-level narrative. It doesn't tell a long story. It doesn't tell a big story. But when humans look into the eyes of other animals, we get a real, we get a feeling We connect with the animals, we humanize the animal, we give it human traits that it may or may not actually have. If I looked into the eyes of um, a lion, often what I project on that shot is, oh, this lion looks determined, or he looks mad. I might give him a, a personality that he may not even necessarily have in that moment, but that is, I project a story onto that lion when I connect with that lion's eyes. And so if you make the eyes the subject of your shot, that is a way to create a story. That's not the only way to create a story, but that is that is one way to do it. Another way to do it is don't show the eyes at all. So I know a lot of people are going, oh, you can't do that. But you can, actually. You can do that. It's a common tip. You'll see it on a billion how-to-do-wildlife photography tip lists that you have to show the eyes. But 
you can choose not to do that. But if you do choose not to do it, make sure it is a choice and not an accident because we can tell the difference. So you can make a point of intentionally not showing the eyes in some of your shots to tell a story. To give you an example, I recently saw a photo of um, some sort of monkey. I don't know. I don't know a lot about monkeys. I'm real into animals, but not not monkeys, really. They kind of scare me. So anyways, this photographer took a shot of a monkey with his head down. And to me, he looked very contemplative. I couldn't even see his eyes because his head was tilted so far down. And he looked very contemplative. I thought maybe he looked sad. That told a story to me. For all I know, he was just looking down because he was uh, picking toe jam out from between his toes. But I don't know that. That was cropped out. So the story there was the the photographer very intentionally got very close in on his face, waited for the moment that he looked down, and cropped out the context of why he may have been looking down, and he let the viewer decide why the monkey was looking down. And I decided um, it was because he was, he was contemplating the, the meaning of life. I saw the comments on that post. A lot of people said he looked sad. That, that is the story they filled in. So you can very intentionally decide not to show the eyes. Now, if it's an accident and the animal just turned around, Don't use that shot. Move on. That one's lost. Okay. My tip number two and a half, sort of. Because I feel like tip number one was kind of a two-parter. Anyways, tip number two. Consider doing a photo series instead of a single shot. Again, some people are really opposed to this idea and think a real photographer doesn't need multiple shots to tell a story. But a photo series is just another method of showing your story. And when you use an entire series, no matter whether that's two shots or ten shots, you can tell a much longer and in-depth story than you would otherwise be able to capture in a single shot. So, again, the key with doing a photo series well is to start out with that intention. Don't let it be an accident. Don't let it be like you got home and you realize the photos you took all do kind of vaguely go together in a series. Make it an intentional decision. It's going to help you set your goals and intentions in your shots, which is going to help you improve in the long run. So consider doing a photo series instead of a single shot. I find that these series work much better when the story being told isn't predictable. Like, personally, a photo series of a bird taking off in flight and then landing wouldn't be very interesting to me. You know, there's there's definitely, all, all of those shots are fine on their own, but as a series, nothing unpredictable happened, so it's just, oh, okay, there it went, and there it landed, okay. But here's an example of something I did uh, last year. So I shot a series of a wildebeest calf that had been separated from its mother when they had crossed the Mara River. I had pictures of this calf running across an empty field. I had shots of him standing alone in a crowd of adults he did not know. One where he ran up to and was frightened by a warthog. Another where he ran up to a group of elephants while calling out for his mother. He went all over the place looking for his mother and he was terrified. One shot could show a scared wildebeest looking for his mother, but a photo series told that story in more depth than I otherwise would have been able to do in just one shot. Now each shot still needs to have its own merits, Still needs to have decent lighting, good composition, stuff like that. But as a photo series, it can be even greater in my opinion. So if you're not already doing photo serieses, serieses, I don't know if that's how you say it. If you're not already doing these things, you may wish to consider it. Okay, so the final tip for this episode on how to create visual narrative 
is seek action. How do you do that? You find two or more animals actively engaging with each other. No surprise there. Um, whether that be grooming one another or ones eating the other. Plan your outings at times and places when you can witness these relationships between animals. That's very key, I found. It's very, very key that you plan your outings for times when animals are actively engaging with each other. So, to give you an example, there is the rut when male deer, moose, animals of that sort, elk, will be fighting each other. And they'll also be breeding with females. So that's two interactions you got right there. Really cool shit to capture. Then later on, you got the spring when females are popping out babies. Females of all sorts popping out babies in there in the spring. I mean, seeing a mother licking her baby and caring for the baby or feeding the baby, thats that gives you emotions. That's a story right there. That is a story of love between a mother and a baby. It can also be a very dramatic time because predator and prey activity can go up, especially with a lot of newborn babies around. So these are just, these are kind of like what I would consider like the, the two main times of the year when there's a lot going on between animals. Outside of that, predator and prey activity is always happening. Animal conflicts are always happening. I would just say that those interactions are much higher during the breeding season, the birthing season, and baby season when the babies are growing up. You're going to get a lot more action during those times of year and during the off times of year when that's not going on. Things usually slow down as far as wildlife photography goes. That's kind of when I switch into bird only mode for the most part. So I have a part B for seek the action as well, that, that tip. And that is, don't forget the moment right before the action happens. That moment is filled with suspense. To go back to my earlier example of the gator coming up on a blue heron, that has suspense. So let's say that that full process went, the gator came up behind it, the gator caught it, and then the gator tore it up and ate it. All right. A lot of people might wait until the gator has actually caught the heron to begin shooting. Many people, if they did shoot that whole process, the only photo they would post would be the gator with the heron in his mouth. That's definitely a story because that, that's the middle of the story. But... The photo right before that snap happens, in my opinion, has much more mystery to it. You don't know how this story is about to play out. So I think the moment right before something, some sort of action happens, is full of suspense and drama and possible mystery. Those shots have, in my opinion, have a much more interesting story. So... I know it's tempting to just go for that glory shot, but think about what is a more complex story and what gets people thinking a little bit more. All right, I got one more thing to say before we go. Be okay with telling stories that others may not understand. This idea that you're not a good photographer if every person doesn't understand one of your shots is ridiculous and completely impractical. You're not obligated to take shots that spoon-feed viewers a story. I think this advice is especially important as a wildlife photographer because we often tell stories with animal body language and behavior that outsiders don't understand. And that's fine. The only person who needs to like and understand your shots is you. Alright guys, that's all I got for today. You can find me on Instagram at adrianj.photography. If you have a suggestion for a topic or you have comments about this episode or any future episodes, you can email us at untamedwildlifephotos at gmail.com. Because we're a new podcast, reviews will really go a long way for us. So if you like this episode, I hope you consider leaving a review. And if you really like this episode, slap that subscribe button. I'll talk to you guys next week.